This is the lecture 2 of unit 1, the second and last lecture of unit 1. Let's see which topics we'll cover in this lecture 2 of unit 1. If you recall, we have already talked about four different topics in lecture 1 of unit 1. So in lecture 2, we are going to talk about glycolysis, Krebs cycle, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, electron transport chain and the inhibitors of electron transport chain, gluconeogenesis, pentose phosphate pathway. So all the topics related to carbohydrate metabolism which is the most important metabolism of all. Although we have protein metabolism and lipid metabolism in syllabus, we are going to talk about that less compared to the carbohydrate metabolism. And we'll also talk about the glycogen metabolism involving the regulation of glycogen conversion to glucose and glucose conversion to glycogen and the role of hormones like insulin or epinephrine in that conversion mode. And like always, the numbers written after every single topic name suggesting the approximate number of questions you are going to expect from the subtopics of the CSI net unit 1. Okay. So in carbohydrate metabolism, what we want to talk about, the big picture of how our body functions uh, when there is plenty of food available, when we digest that food and all the nutrients are present in the bloodstream. And we'll also see a big picture when uh, we lack uh, any of those macromolecules presence in the bloodstream, like in a situation where we are literally starving. So what happens in our body when we are starving and we, when we have adequate amount of food in our body? So let's, let's see that. Uh, with this first uh, view of picture where we see well-fed state of the body, we call it lipogenic phase of the body. You know, when we are preparing this carbohydrate metabolism, there are a few things I want you to remember. You know, all the steps of carbohydrate metabolism that begins with glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and then electron transport system to generate energy, we call it oxidative phosphorylation. So all the steps that we, we discuss you need to understand where those steps actually conducted inside the cell okay and which part of the body is involved which organs are more involved in the specific part of the pathway so locations of the metabolic pathway is a very important thing that you should remember clearly you know although you remember all the name of the enzyme and stuff but many a times you will forget where those pathways actually take place and they will ask question from the basic as where those pathways actually take place so it's very important you should remember that so the very first thing that we know is that in our body there are different organs and systems and apart from those organs and systems there are structures like this uh, this liver liver plays what i say the most important role or you can say the brain of and the heart of the whole metabolic pathway because liver is involved uh, in a situation which can uh, help us take the decision of either utilizing the resources that we have generating energy or if we already have enough energy then we take that resources and convert them and store them uh, as a form so that we can utilize further in the future. So the state where we are well fed, uh, like we have all the nutrients after the digestion, they are present in the bloodstream. So we call it lipogenic phase of the liver. You know, lipogenic phase means if you look at this, in this liver, lipogenic phase means that this liver is now ready uh, for the process of storing some of the macromolecules after some of the nutrients after the digestion. So what happens here in the bloodstream we have enough glucose, enough amino acids and fats. So what this liver takes, liver takes amino acids and glucose directly inside and those amino acids are converted into alpha keto acids to produce urea and they excrete it out of the body where uh, they also convert the amino into protein. So they help them in protein synthesis and the proteins are required by our body. Now the glucose uh, liver uptake, the glucose is then converted through the pathway of glycolysis producing pyruvate through the pathway of PCA cycle producing uh, ultimately through the pathway of uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to produce acetyl-CoA and the moment it produces acetyl-CoA then this acetyl-CoA is dissociated to form ATP and CO2. The CO2 is uh, is exhaled out and the ATP is producing the energy. This is the energy currency of the cell. Now rest of the part producing TAG, you know acetyl-CoA is an important ingredient to produce triacylglycerol and once they produce this triacylglycerol, now what we are doing here, we have glucose which is must most simplest form of the sugar that we can get but we are literally converting it into forming TAG triacylglycerol and the reason we are forming triacylglycerol is that we want to store 
that TAG convert them into VL, DL, very low density lipoprotein, and then store them into adipose tissue uh, in our body. So this is how it works. Normally, when our body is deprived of the glucose, then our body starves for glucose. So if in those situations, if liver gets glucose, the liver utilizes the glucose to convert through pyruvate uh, and, and then the process of glycolysis Krebs cycle and uh, the electron transport chain to produce energy. But in this case, it's not producing energy, it's simply converting it into uh, triacylglycerol, storing them in the adipose tissue for future use. Now, some part of the glucose need to be supplied to the brain because, you know, our brain depends on glucose for its sole survival. So, generally, brain requires glucose. That's the only form of nutrient brain can understand, brain can digest, brain can take. So, brain gets the glucose uh, after the glucose excess is present in the liver. So, liver supplies the glucose to the brain. Apart from glucose, uh, brain can also take one more, one other type of nutrient, that is the ketone bodies. But that's rare occasions. If the glucose is present, brain will take glucose. Now, what about this fat, which is already present in the, in the intestine, you know? When the fat is present in the intestine through the bloodstream, the fat is transferred again through the lymphatic system into our muscle. And in the muscle, that fat, like the TAG, triacylglycerol, is converted into fatty acids. Okay, And the moment they are converted to fatty acids, they will also produce some ATP and CO2. The CO2 is again released out and those fatty acids are again, uh, can be like utilized for producing energy. Like ATP is produced and CO2 is, is exhaled out. So this idea is we supply this fat to the muscle to properly supply them the energy. Because normally the fat that we have in the TAG format, if our, our muscles do not need the fat at that time, it's not doing any work. Generally, human muscle is doing work all the time. So they need the supply of energy and fatty acids can be huge amount of energy compared with glucose or compared with any kind of carbohydrates or proteins because